everything you need to know about fundamentals of contract law will be finished, well, by Sunday night, maybe. Um, hopefully, maybe even today. Uh, so, yeah, what do you know? And there's still lots of you. I don't know whether you just come to laugh at me, like what's going on, but um, it's very good. This is, um, it's really cool that there are so many people coming to class. That's intentionally said to, for those of you on the recording so that you feel guilty, those people who didn't come to class. Oh, now I haven't hit the button to make that work. Come on. Come on. Okay. Some, oh, there we go. Uh, so, what we're doing today is we're expanding on this idea of what the contents of a contract are by exploring how we read terms and in particular how we look at excluding or limiting terms. So there are a couple of different particular difficulties so it makes the kind of term quite useful to read. Um, and it also gives us an opportunity to sort of do a bit of a deeper dive into that question of how contract sits next to, or the common law of contract sits next to statutory rules. Um, so, without any further ado, you, you guys know me well enough to stop me and ask questions as we go, right? Because today, I think we're just going to do a whole heap of content so that by Sunday night and then into week 12, it's all about whatever questions you have that you want to answer. So, when we think about exclusion clauses, this is the model that I like to use. We've got to think first about the terminology that we're using. What, how do we know, just from the heading used or otherwise, what kind of clause we're looking at? So, sometimes they're called exclusion clauses, sometimes they're called exemption clauses, sometimes they're called exception clauses. Um, the range of different kind of clauses themselves, the headings, might be things like entire agreement clauses, which by their very nature exclude things that happened other than what was written in the written document. They might be um, limitation clauses. So the heading might talk about limiting in some way. What is the purpose of this kind of clause? Ultimately, it's to reduce a party's liability, whether that's in an express or in a contained sense. So a, uh, a clause that is a um, entire agreement clause, for example. So it's very noisy out there. I'm just gonna see what I can do to limit it a bit. Um, that limits a person as a party's liability by restricting the matters that can be disputed under the contract to the things that are in the written document. Another kind of limitation clause might be a clause that says what the consequences of a breach of agreement will be. So say, for example, I always use sale and purchase of businesses because I spend a lot of time with those kind of agreements, but a sale and purchase of business agreement will have usually a set of warranties in it. So promises that the owner of the business has made about the business, for example, that it has so many customers, that its regular turnover is X, that it has all of the licences that it needs. So if it's a cafe, for example, that it has a food and beverage licence or whatever the equivalent is from the local council, that it can seat up to however many customers. And then a limitation clause might deal with what happens if any of those promises aren't kept or any of those assurances are incorrect. So it might say something like, if any of the warranties in section blah, blah, blah turn out to be incomplete or inaccurate, then it could be anything from the vendor will indemnify the purchaser from any damage. So what does indemnify mean in that context? Cover the, the losses associated. Make good the loss or damage that is suffered. So an indemnity holds a person, the beneficiary of the indemnity, harmless from the debt. So even if they had no obligation to make that promise, then an indemnity would still hold them harmless from that. It might say that they guarantee those obligations. And then if it turned out that for some reason there was a vitiating factor that meant that 
they weren't actually bound by the contract or whatever it was that they were guaranteeing, then they'd be off scot-free. Um, it might also say, um, often we have, we call them caps and collars clauses. So it might say, if any of the warranties in clause blah, blah, blah are incorrect and the vendor's damage is more than $10,000, then the, sorry, the purchaser's damage is more than $10,000, then the vendor has to compensate them up to a maximum of a million dollars. I'm just picking numbers. So there is a, a cap, uh, well, sorry, a collar, in the sense of if it's just a little bit of damage, you're just going to take that risk and I don't have to pay you. But if it's more than $10,000, then I have to pay you. But the maximum I'll have to pay you is... Um, the $1 million. That's quite a common way of doing it. Um, a limitation clause might also say, we're not making you any promises whatsoever at all. You rely on your own inquiries and we're not making you any promises. Um, we might support that with an insurance agreement or something like that. So any, they're just, there's lots of different ways that you can limit liability in the same scenario. And we could pick any other scenario and explore the different kind of limitations. So sometimes they reduce a party's liability. So when I was talking a minute ago about the caps and collars, they, they basically say, well, you'll only be liable if there's $10,000 worth of damage and the maximum amount that you will have to pay is that. So that can reduce the overall liability in a way. It might exclude altogether. And often, regardless of the way they do it, it's about allocating risk. It's about saying, who is the person who is best placed to take on this risk? So if we have got a receiver selling a business or an administrator selling a business, they don't know anything very much about it. Um, they don't want to take on any additional liabilities. Let's say the owner of the business is in liquidation, it's being wound up. They won't take on any liability. And as a, co a consequence, the risk will be passed to the purchaser. And the purchaser, the benefit that they get for taking on that additional risk is they'll usually get a reduced price. So, you know, like they say in real estate or software development, you can have it good, you can have it fast, or you can have it cheap, but you can't have all three. You've got to pick two. And the same with any kind of commercial arrangements. We work out, well, if you want it cheap, then chances are you'll take on more risk. So risk-free, cheap, or fast. And nothing ever happens fast. Um, and so what's the justification for exclusion clauses? Ultimately, they form part of this private law idea of contract law, which we started with way back in week one, that idea that the common law supports the idea that grown-up people who have capacity, who enter into an arrangement where they intended for it to be legally bound, binding and they exchange consideration with each other for the promises that were made, that they can create any kind of private law between them. It, that is a set of rules that applies to them. So if somebody actually agrees to, that the other party can limit their liability, that's just giving effect to the private law. Uh, it's this idea of freedom of contract, the freedom to allocate risk between the parties. But of course, these ideas are grounded in this idea that whenever a contract is made, both parties have an equality of bargaining power. That both parties get to contribute to or negotiate what the terms are. And we know in practice that that is actually a very rare thing, that we enter into many, many contracts in our lives, including for the big things like buying a house or borrowing the money to buy a house, the amount of negotiation that you have... I tell you what, I have spent more time deciding whether or not to buy a pair of shoes and then haggling over some detail of the shoes than I have buying any of the houses that I have bought. And I've probably had more flexibility when it comes to the terms. And we know as a matter of reality that you want it, you can either afford it or you can't, and there is a very little scope for negotiation in relation to these things. I'm probably telling you things I shouldn't. So, it will not surprise you at all that even though the good old common law rests on this assumption that there is an equality of bargaining power, 
um, legislation has tried to fix some of those gaps. So there are some limitations on the way exclusion clauses can work that have been imposed by statute. So before we even start, I want you to sort of think about this. We will go through whether the, uh, the circumstances where statutes apply in a second. But the best way to approach these problems is to ask yourself whether a statute applies that will impact whether or not limitation clauses can work. If the answer to that is no, then we'll head on and look at the common law tests. But if the answer is yes, then we go straight to the statute. Um, particularly if, and in this course, these are the ones we're talking about. We're talking about the Australian Consumer Law, and in particular, sections 276 and 276A of the Australian Consumer Law, where those provisions uh, exclude the ability to exclude the law. So when you, or remove the ability to exclude the law. So if we go back a week or two and we think about Lestrange and Grau Cub. Remember Lestrange and Grau Cub, which is the original or, or the clearest UK authority with the statement that if it looks like a contract and you sign it, it doesn't matter that you didn't read it, you will be bound by those terms. And the terms that were in dispute in that uh, case were, was a clause that basically said um, to, it probably didn't even say to the maximum extent allowed by law, it just said we exclude the operation of any statute, we don't give you any warranties, you accept this cigarette vending machine as is and the risk is yours effectively. If it doesn't work, that's your bad. If it, it doesn't matter, We've, we're not taking on any responsibility. Sorry, I think I'm going to sneeze shortly, which is really going to hurt the ears of you at home. Sorry about that. Um, so these days, that kind of clause could not be excluded. So even with the words, to the maximum extent allowed by law, which you will see quite often, the law says you cannot, if, if the statute applies, you cannot exclude those provisions. Harry, were you about to ask a question? So, back to the common law test. In order to work out whether a disclaimer is part of a contract, a disclaimer or a limiting clause of some kind is a part of the contract, and then what it actually limits and how it works, we just start with a pretty simple test. Firstly, is it part of the contract? Secondly, is the party who is relying on it privy to the contract? And if it is, if those two are matched, then the clause will apply in the dispute. So how, oh, actually, not straight away. We'll get to how we work out whether they're incorporated in a moment. Well, actually, I don't know that I will talk about that separately because the work that we did in the last two weeks have all be, has all been about identifying what are the clauses of the contract, what is or isn't incorporated. So, again, going back, most of the examples that we had, particularly in week 10, when we were looking at the express terms of the contract, were really looking at whether this kind of clause was or wasn't part of the contract. Was, was there a limitation? So on this slide here, I've got an example of what a limitation of liability clause might look like. Uh, this one um, is a pretty comprehensive one and it comes from a trustee. So it's effectively a clause where the trustee, so the person who is appointed under the trustee as being responsible for managing the assets of a trust for the benefit of beneficiaries of that trust. Um, under which they limit their liability. So this is probably from a family trust from memory or something like that, but the rules would be very similar if the trustee of your superannuation fund, for example. So what does it say? The trustee is not liable for any loss arising from its administration or management of the trust. So in other words, the trustee won't be responsible for any loss that arises from the way that it manages the money in the bank account unless it's been dishonest, so unless that arises because the trustee's been dishonest, or because it willfully does something that it knows to be a breach of trust. So pretty broad, it's not covering things that it does accidentally, or it just 
It's basically saying only those things that it does dishonestly or on purpose will be covered. And then that is backed, no problem at all, um, that is backed then with an indemnity. So again, and it's quite good drafting requires if we've got an obligation or a set of rights to back that up with, well, what's the consequence if that goes wrong? So if you make a promise in relation to something, so you're giving warranties or receiving warranties, you want that to match with, well, what's the consequence if you don't keep those promises? And so this one says, provided that the trustees acted in good faith, it's entitled to be indemnified out of the trust for all debts, damages, obligations, other liabilities incurred, arising or awarded by or against it in the execution of any power, duty, discretion, authority under the deed in respect of all things that it does that relate to or concern the money in the fund or the assets in the fund. So very broad. If I, I was a kid's show, AJ, if I touch it, I own it. It's like if I touch it, if I do anything with it, as long as I'm acting in good faith, you have to reimburse me for it. Um, Provided the trustee acts in good faith, it will be entitled to reimbursement from the trust fund for anything that it spends in or about administering the trust. And thirdly, it might, the trustee can, as long as it's acting in good faith, apply the trust fund or any monies or properties in the trust as it decides to satisfy the rights of reimbursement or indemnity which it's entitled to. So in other words, trustee's limitation is liability is limited, it will only get into trouble if something goes wrong and it's been dishonest or it's done something that it absolutely knew it shouldn't do. And if it spends any money or it incurs any expense or it otherwise troubles itself in any way, it can take any money it likes or deal with any asset in the fund however it wants to. So can you see how both sides of that are, uh, are addressing it, the liability that the trustee has? Here's one that you can see quite a lot. This is probably an American one um, as a consequence of the, I can tell that because it's all in caps. So the Uniform Contract Code in the US, which applies, I believe, in most states, if not all, requires if you have a clause in an agreement that limits somebody's right, that you have to put it in bold and all caps. Despite the fact that there is lots of research that shows that shouty caps make things harder to read than ever, and it's actually less likely that people who receive a document that's filled with shouty caps will actually read the shouty caps bit. That is actually what the law says. So I'm always inclined to read these ones in shouty caps. The fact that it actually has punctuation is quite unusual, but let's face it, it only got two commas, I think, in the whole of it. In no event will the company, so whoever it is, be liable to you, probably the customer, for any lost profits, lost savings or incidental, indirect, special or consequential damages arising out of your use or inability to use the product or the breach of this agreement, even if advised of the possibility of such damages. Some states do not allow the limitation or exclusion of liability for incidental or consequential damages, so the above limitation or exclusion might not apply to you. Pretty common, you'll see them a lot, especially if your way of procrastinating is like mine and involves buying pieces of software or apps on your phone. Okay, framework for addressing, what have I put in here? As I mentioned before, we start with whether the legislation applies, if the, then we then go to whether the clause is properly incorporated, is the party seeking to rely on the clause a party to the contract, and then lastly, as a matter of construction, so as a matter of the law as it relates to how we read contracts, does the clause exclude or reduce liability in relation to a matter in dispute? So if the legislation applies, go directly to the legislation. Look at the rules uh, in relation to whether things are incorporated, so topic nine. Privity, we did as topic seven or eight, can't remember exactly. And we're going to spend most of our time today in this last area. And we'll do a little bit of the legislation. So, what is the common law approach? Ultimately, the common law approach requires us to read and understand 
whether or not the language in the clause can limit liability with regard to the factual situation at hand. It will not surprise you that the courts will use an objective test. You see a lot of objective tests in this subject. Um, but we also need to understand what kind of language we're looking for. Um, so if an exclusion clause is unambiguous, then we will construe the clause according to its natural and ordinary meaning. However, if the clause is ambiguous and we can't make sense of it, as a last resort we use this principle that is called the contra preferentum principle. In other words, we look at who has the benefit of the clause and we interpret it as strictly against that person. So we give it the narrowest interpretation. But that's after looking objectively at the facts and working out what it is that the parties intended at the time the contract was entered into. Turn the sound off my phone. So what is the contra preferentum rule? So contra, I don't really like Latin, but this is the rule. Uh, contra means against. Proferentum, in that sense, is against the proferens. So the proferens is the person or party who has the benefit of the clause. So if there is an ambiguity, an exclusion clause will be construed against the proferens, as a consequence, a narrow interpretation. So a good example from your textbook, I don't know if this one's in the casebook, I don't remember. Uh, Wallace and Pratt, Wallace and Wells and Pratt and Haynes. Um, in that particular uh, contract, the uh, or dispute, the limitation clause related to a warranty. And because it specifically referred to a warranty and was ambiguous, it was construed contra preferentum, which meant that it did, the exclusion did not apply to a breach of condition. So if the clause had said, uh, you know, it, look, it said something like, uh, to the maximum extent allowed by the law, um, any breach of warranty by, this, by the vendor uh, will only apply, uh, uh, will only result in damages for a maximum of a dollar, something like that. They breached a condition, they were then sued in relation to the breach of a condition. Everybody remember the difference between a condition and a warranty? So a condition is one of the essential terms. It's breach of a condition will allow you to terminate the contract. So uh, the question then became, could they seek damages in relation to the breach? Uh, the breaching party pointed to the limitation clause and said, look at this clause, it says, that our liability is limited in relation to breaches of warranty. There was, the dispute then went to, well, what does it mean? Because it was ambiguous, the contra preferentum rule applied and it was construed against the person having the benefit narrowly to only uh, apply to breaches of warranty and not to breaches of conditions. Let me give you another example of how this works. So this again from your textbook, is Darlington Futures and Delco. So this is a mid-1980s case, um, and the facts that give rise to this happen in the early 80s and involve futures trading, not surprisingly, given the names of the parties. So basically, um, Delco appointed Darlington Futures to hedge their futures market risk. So effectively to trade on the futures exchange for them to limit their risks in relation to forward pricing. I can't remember what Delco did. Has anybody got a vague understanding of how futures markets works? I said anybody, not everybody. Okay, additional homework for you all. You have to watch Trading Paces with Eddie Murphy because you will understand it and it'll be good for your stress. And if you don't find that movie funny, I just feel sorry for you. So. Um, yeah, go back to trading places, but 
in a nutshell, there are certain things that people have to do where they need to commit to payments or receipts in a different currency. So, as any of you who have watched the news will know, the Australian economy lives or dies in some ways by the iron, price of iron ore. And the price of iron ore is always in US dollars. So, when the Australian dollar is low, then effectively we get more value for our iron ore buck than when the price is high. So when people commit to doing things like paying miners and buying trucks and replacing tyres on big trucks and things like that, they're doing so, they're committing their money on the basis that they're pre-sold at some level um, this iron ore at a particular price. But as the market, as the dollar goes up and down, then they may need to find ways to hedge against their risk. So hedging is usually about trying to um, really maintain your cash flow in the most possible way. So, and then other people will speculate, so that's what they're doing. But still, I think trading places will explain it much more, much better. And you'll think, you'll laugh every time you buy oranges from that point onwards. So, they were given an agreement to sign and the agreement said lots of really boring things, blah, 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 and then Clause 6 said, Darlington has no liability for any loss from trading on Delco's behalf. And Clause 7 said, the maximum amount Darlington must pay for breach arising out of or in connection with this contract will be 100 bucks. So, off Darlington went, and as is the way of hedge tra fund traders in the 80s, again, I will prescribe Wall Street as the movie for this. Um, any of them, but probably the first one, just for the phones. Um, so, they, as they want to do, they just went off and did unauthorised trading. And as tends to happen, because the only time they ever seem to get caught doing unauthorised training is when they lose money. So they lost a whole lot of Delco's money. And so they basically, Delco sued them and said, you've got to pay us, you've got to pay up for these losses. And they said, nah, we don't. Because we've got this exclusion clause in our contract. So what happened? Questions before the court were these. Did Clause 6 protect the broker from the consequences of what otherwise would have been a breach of contract? And then, if it did or it didn't, was the broker protected by Clause 7 of the contract anyway? So let's go back a step. What do you guys think? Clause 6. Darlington has no liability for any loss from trading on Delco's behalf. Does that limit Darlington's liability for trades that it did that were unauthorised? You don't think it does? Anybody think it does? Pretty broad clause. Any loss from trading? Okay. Sorry? It doesn't clearly specify whether it's authorised or unauthorised. Doesn't clearly specify that it's authorised or unauthorised. So we could argue that it's ambiguous in that regard. Um, it's so noisy out there. Um, absolutely. So you, as a consequence, then the contra preferentum rule might apply, which would bring us back. But you're absolutely right to look at that. So. Court agreed with you. I thought I could string it out for a bit, but I'm not in the mood. Um, clause does not protect the broker. Clause only applies to activity undertaken on behalf of the client. So trading on behalf of the client. So that implies with the client's authority. So trading wasn't authorised in this uh, um, extent. Um, Ken's argument too works in exactly the same way. Um, if it had said any trading, and that was ambiguous as to whether that was trading authorised or trading in an unauthorised way, then the contra preferentum rule would have kicked in to say, well, we're going to in look at this in a narrow way. So the court found that there was no intention for the clause to exclude the trader from liability for unauthorised trade. So what about clause seven then? 
Was the broker protected in any way from, by this clause, the maximum amount Darlington must pay for breach arising out of or in connection with the contract is $100? What do we think? Some of you will have read it, so you'll know, but... It's limiting the liability to $100. Yeah, they're limiting liability here to $100. So do you, will that take effect? Yes. You are right. It does protect the broker. The clause is expressed to cover any claim arising out of or in connection with the relationship established by the agreement. And they wouldn't be able to trade in an unauthorised way unless they had a relationship that was established by the agreement. I kept thinking of this case last year when the um, Banking Royal Commission was on and people were being shocked about how banks worked. I'm like, this is not new. I, I'm not making excuses for it, but it's just like this has been around for a while. This is kind of how the system works. Um, Unauthorised transaction has a substantial connection with the relationship of broker and client established by the agreement. So the maximum amount they had to pay was 100 bucks, plus roughly two thirds of uh, Delco's costs of bringing the action. But I'm guessing that Delco was further out of pocket as a consequence. The next rule that we need to look at as we think about exclusion clauses is that exclusion clauses are subject to what we call the four corners rule. And I'm officially dubbing this the most annoying slide I have ever put together. And every semester I think, yeah, I must change that. And I forget to look at them animated. So an exclusion clause cannot protect uh, the beneficiary or sort of the beneficiary of that clause from liability for things that are outside the scope of the contract. So an exclusion clause is unlikely to have been intended to apply to things that were outside the authority. It doesn't sit nicely with Delco, but let me give you an example of how it works. So this is a council of city in Sydney, usually shows up in citations as CCS, uh, CCS and West. 1965, a particularly good year for breeding law lecturers, I think. Um, 1965, New South, oh, it's actually a high court case. So Mr West, I think it was Mr West, uh, parked his car in the garage that was owned by the city council. The contract or the terms required him to show his ticket before he could get his car back. So he's left his car keys with uh, the attendant and he's supposed to come back with his ticket. A bad guy came in and claimed that he had lost the ticket and the attendant gave the, um, the thief another ticket um, it actually had the wrong registration attached to it, but he gave him the keys, so it really didn't actually matter, did it? Uh, not surprisingly, the bad guy drove away with Mr West's car, and Mr West was not happy about this. So the question became, could the standard clause that was on the car parking uh, ticket, terms and conditions, that excluded the car park from liability for loss or damage, apply to this situation. And the court said, no, it can't, because the act that caused the damage was not something that was authorised. The city had set up its own system, which is you leave your keys with us, you only get them back when you produce the ticket, and then it had breached its own system by somebody else, that, you know, by being fooled by the bad guy. Um, so, the majority here was influenced by the fact that the attendant had allowed the thief, who called himself Mr Robinson, um, again, yeah, it's probably a little bit too early. I think the graduate was a few years after that. I can't remember, I should know that, shouldn't I? Anyway, um, the, the majority was influenced by Robinson um, 
taking the car contrary to the terms that the council had put out. The clause had no application to negligence by the council's employees in the performance of acts that were neither authorised or permitted by the contract. However, if there's no ambiguity, then the common law will apply. It will uphold an exclusion clause even when it is really broad. So Nisho EY and Malaysian International Shipping Corporation 1989 High Court case, a clearly worded clause can exclude liability even if it defeats the main purpose of the contract. Um, another really good example is where there was an unambiguous uh, clause in photo production and secure accord transport, which I think I've got on a separate slide coming up. And this itself was cited with approval in Darlington, so we'll come back to it in a minute. The, just going back to the City of West case, a City of Sydney and West case, we often refer to that as a deviation, where there isn't a protection under the exclusion clause because the party with the benefit of the clause has deviated from the terms of the contract. So in um, TNT and May and Baker, um, we see another good example of this. So where a carrier, and this is like a transport company, can't rely on an exclusion clause if it deviates from the contractually agreed route or voyage. So this is a good example of the Four Corners rule in action. So um, Thomas National Transport, probably better known to us all as TNT Transport, took goods by road from Sydney to Melbourne. Um, Effectively what it would do, they would leave very early in the morning, they would drive down the Hume Highway in the evening, they would go into TNT's warehouse, park the truck, and then first thing in the morning they would then take the things out of the truck and distribute them to different people around Melbourne in different places. Okay, Pretty standard way that they did things. So on this one particular night, there was a driver who lived in Melbourne, probably not very far from the warehouse. I don't know, I'm just adding facts in because I like to do that. He had driven from Sydney to Melbourne, down the Hume, parked his car in front of his house, or his truck in front of his house, instead of taking it to the depot. Maybe he did that often, maybe he only did it this one time, we won't know. The reason we know he did it this time is because that particular day his house caught on fire. The fire went out and damaged the goods in the truck. And so the question became for the court, was TNT protected by a clause that said that they would be excluded from liability or damage to goods, um, even a very broad exclusion clause? Um, sorry, I thought I had more on the next slide, but clearly I have to rely on my memory instead of the pictures to remind myself today. And the short answer is no, it cannot. Again, because this is a four corners rule in action. The, the, the contract said that they were going to go from Sydney, go to the warehouse and then be distributed. And it's one thing for people who are looking for their goods to be taken from Sydney to Melbourne um, to be prepared for uh, to take on the risk of loss or damage when they know that they're going to a secure warehouse out the back of Tullamarine somewhere. Um, they weren't expecting that their goods were going to be in the truck outside a house that was clearly a fire risk. Uh, and so they, TNT was not protected by the clause. So what about negligence? Can we have a, an exclusion of liability provision that excludes a party's liability for negligence? Okay, who in this room has done or is doing torts now? Oh, they put their hands up hardly at all, just in case I ask them questions. <laughs> I'm relying on those of you at home to shout at the recording really loudly right now because my knowledge of tort is really, really limited. Um, other than some basic principles, you can disagree with me if you like because you've done it more recently than I have. Ultimately, one of the big differences between torts and contract, and let's face it, there aren't many. They're both taught by incredibly charming and women who, you know, like, <laughs> 
they're good with the jokes. One of them fronts up with chocolate, I'm reliably informed. The other one would never get chocolate from her house to here without eating it all. So, you know, one of us, one of them is tall and slim, one of us not so much and probably a lot happier for it. Um, anyway, I really shouldn't say shit like that on the recording, should I? It'll get out there. Hi, Tina, I love you. Anyway, um, contracts, all about the private law, where we basically have parties who, in theory, have equal bargaining power and they make a private law between them as in relation to the subject matter. Where torts is all about the public law, about duties that you owe the world or your neighbour. Uh, duties to take reasonable care, either in specific situations, you know, because you're putting somebody under, under an anaesthetic or you're cutting their hair and you shouldn't play with scissors, things like that. Um, or whether it's in a more general sense that you own a property and you shouldn't let gas leak out and kill your neighbours with it or your cows get out and upset somebody else's chickens. I don't know. I don't, there must be better cases than that. And when I did torts, it was all about kids falling over in swimming pools. Do you still have lots of those? <laughs> it's just like, it put me off owning a swimming pool for life. Anyway, um, so, you know, public duties are pretty important duties. They're, you know, clearly most of the academics in the law school are all about public law, so it must be really important and special. So can we actually limit our obligations in negligence in contract? What do you reckon? People are quickly reading the slide. What do you think? Short answer is yes. Again, that's how strong this private law idea is in common law. That if there is a clear intention for an exclusion clause to cover liability and negligence, then it can be effective. It needs to be very clear and unambiguous. Contra preferentum rule otherwise will narrow it. Um, but if there's no prospect of liability without negligence, then it might not even have to be that, uh, that, that clear. And we'll look at Davis and Pierce parking in a minute. Oh, in fact, straight away. So again, is this putting you guys off parking your cars anywhere? Will you all have electric bikes and bike share or something like that as a consequence? 1954 case, Mr Davis parked his car in a parking station. Um, he got a thing called the parking check. Um, on it, it said, you need to exchange this piece of paper um, before the motor vehicle can be obtained. Um, and it had this exclusion clause. The car is garaged at the owner's risk and the parking station will not be responsible for loss or damage of any description. So it doesn't specifically talk about negligence. It just says loss or damage of any description. <clears throat> a bad guy came in, stole the keys, drove the car away. Uh, that happened, sorry, let me remind myself of the facts. It happened as a consequence of the negligence of the servants or the, the employees. Uh, they left the car with the keys in it. In, they went and parked the car and they just left it with the car, car key in. Um, so, car went away. So, what happened? The exemption clause should be ex uh, construed here as excluding liability for negligence. It was sufficiently worded to protect the parking station from liability for negligence. So, they were not liable for the theft of the car. Now, why? Why does this work? Now, I think this judgment here, and we've got, I've got Chief Justice Dixon, McTiernan, Webb, Fulliger and Kitto, so it's a full court of the high court judgment. And I do, I always find it hilarious that we've got parking, dry cleaning, swimming pools in front of the high court. I think they do more interesting things, but anyway. Uh, this paragraph, I think, sums it up really beautifully. The defendant was, so Mr, Mr uh, sorry, Pierce was, making a very small charge for taking the custody of goods which are or may be of great value. He is likely to intend, and Davis would reasonably expect him to intend, to protect himself against, amongst other things, a possibly very heavy liability arising from the negligence of an employee. Either party can ensure 
And such a clause might reasonably be taken by uh, Pierce Parking, sorry, Davis, I should say, by Davis, to mean that if he wishes to be protected against loss or damage at all, he must insure. So effectively, they're looking at it from an economic point of view. Yes, they were there was negligence, but the cost that would be incurred by the parking station of insuring to the extent that they would be able to get a payout if their employees were negligent would be so great that the cost of car parking would go up, which in 1954 was seen as a bad thing. I think there's lots of things that are happening in economics now to try and push the cost of parking up so less people drive places. But um, in 1954, that was seen as a bad thing. So again, it's about allocation of risk. And that's a lot of what contract particularly contract making is about. It's, not, it's as commercial as it is legal. We're working out who is best placed to bear these risks. And another car, drives apart. So what happens where, can you actually have a provision that excludes liability from loss or damage that arises under a contract when there's a deliberate breach? We'll just do this one and then I'll give you a break. Um, the courts have tended to require very clear wording, but it's not impossible to do. Davis and Pierce Parking, which we just had a look at, and Council of the City, Sydney and West are two cases where we can see from that point of view that an employee has done something wrong, has effectively breached the contract. Um, they had different results in those two, but different disclaimer clauses as well. And TNT is another example. Again, in that case, it wasn't covered, but if the wording had been different, maybe it would have been. So let's look at Securicor, which I've mentioned a couple of times, and then I will let you have a break. Um, very, very strongly word, uh, worded provisions uh, that ended up with uh, the, the clause holding. So in that case, there was a factory um, and Securicore Transport Limited provided a um, security guards for the factory. Um, so the factory was owned by Photo Production. Not surprisingly from their name, they had photographic equipment there. This is the olden days when photographs required chemicals to produce as opposed to just space on your phone. So the chemicals were entirely flammable and so it was, you know, there were risks associated with this factory that meant that they had a 24-hour security guard. They subcontracted out to Securicore to provide that. Only it was in Britain and it was cold and damp and there was no heating at night. So our security guard, who was a, an employee of Securicore, um, breached the rules of the terms of the contract and lit himself a little fire to warm his hands by. Anyway, it didn't go well. Didn't go well, the whole factory burnt down and the question then became, well actually let me have a look at the clause. Securicor will under no circumstances be responsible for any injurious act or default by any employee unless such act or default could have been foreseen and avoided by the exercise of due diligence on the part of Securicor. So Securicor brought evidence and said, actually, we did our due diligence on our security guard. There was, we did a criminal records check. We didn't see any evidence of arson. Uh, he came with good references. We had no reason to believe that he was so stupid that he would light a fire next to a whole heap of chemicals. Um, and, you know, on the whole, we, you know, saw no reason to not employ him, so we're covered by the clause. And ultimately, sorry, nothing more there, and ultimately they were successful. And I will be more successful if I have something to drink. Will we take a five minute break, stretch legs, whatever, come back at 25-2, we'll scoot through the second half. Thank you for your attention and you at home. You do the same, walk the dog or something, will you?